back them in here, guys. We got six speakers. And if you, if you get tired and you want to go home, go home. Just know we'll be judging you. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. If you, if you, if you, if you can't set that home, it's not right. Yeah, I'll flash for once in there. Between speakers, just we'll take little breaks here and there. Fellowship. We're going to eat. We're going to have food after the third speaker, and then we'll come back and have three more speakers tonight. Stay close to all of them. This first guy, Joe Osteen's little brother. Oh, <laughs> this, uh, this, first, this first guy, Eric Cradle, some of you may know him, some of you don't. I met Eric through a guy named Paul Kilby. Paul Kilby was the first guy that ever visited my church. Amen. Off of, off of YouTube, he's a school teacher in Texas. He fought with Eric for a long time. <laughs> Eric was a legalist. Yep. Thought he could lose his salvation and everything. Yeah. Don't mean tell me, bro. That's fine. fine. Amen. Glory to God. But, uh, to love Brother Eric. He's, he gets on Zoom calls with me on Monday nights and, and he's been a big encouragement. I've seen him grow a lot. Amen. And Brother Eric Cradle from Missouri, hopefully soon to be from West Virginia. Amen. Yes. Yep, be praying for us. We just looked at an apartment yesterday. Right. Yep, put the app in, so pray that goes well. Thankful to be here with all y'all, man, amongst the brethren. Have a little righteousness and peace and join the Holy Ghost. Amen. We're going to start in 2 Timothy, chapter 3. What a verse Paul gave me to preach on. 3.14, I'll read it. Look at the time so I don't get the, get the preaching too long here. 10 after. 2 Timothy 3.14, brother. He, Paul writes, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And I got looking at that and I said, what a verse, man. How are you going to preach on what, what I've learned? I'm like, where do you start? This is going to be a 30-page message. So I thought, you know, let's study this honestly. Let's see where Paul started, right? Go back to the first chapter of that. Verse 1, right? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of what? Life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved what? So that's how it opens up. And I'm like, okay, well, let's see where the first one opens up, right? But back there, 1 Timothy 1. one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now it's by the commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our what? Amen. Unto Timothy, he says, my own son in the faith. I'm like, all right, I got a starting point. Go to my e-sword, my son. Where does that take you? Guess where it takes me, guys? It takes me to Proverbs, actually. But look, before we go there, we're going to go there. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Chapter 1 and verse 9. Paul writes, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that, here's the purpose, ye might be filled with the what? That's the first thing I'm starting to see. Go ahead and read the rest of the verse. Somebody, Paul. Knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So you got knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, right? I'm seeing these things everywhere, guys. Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. These, these go together, man. They're like joined at the hip, right? So keep these in the forefront of your mind. And he says that in verse 10. So here's the purpose of that prayer. Ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the what? Knowledge of God. All right, keep these in your mind. Let's go to Proverbs 1. I'm going to start at verse 1. Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know, there's your knowledge, wisdom, and instructions usually tagging along somewhere, not every time with these, to perceive the words of understanding, there they are, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple. You know what that means? It means it's going to make you smart. Amen? Yep. To the young man, knowledge and discretion, a wise man will what? He will hear and will increase in learning. A man of understanding shall attain 
unto wise counsels. You see that colon there? This is the explanation of that. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, and the interpretation, the words of the wise in their dark sayings. Now guys, I understand that this, on the surface, you're going to see it's really a father instructing his son in wisdom. I understand that deeper things are dealing with Israel in our last days, but for the sake of this message, we're going to stay on the surface. Amen. So let's just read it for what it says for right now. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Amen. Well, we've got to start there. But fools despise what? Okay. And here's where it took me. This is what my Esau took me to. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Amen. Look at 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consult thou not. 15. My son, what? And this is where it occurred to me. This is just a father instructing his son in his walk, right? So I started digging in. This ain't a message on Proverbs. Let's just look at a few things. Chapter 2. Look at verse 1. My son again. If, big if, thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thy ear unto what? Wisdom. There it is. And I underline these, guys. This is how I study this, so that my eye pops when I see these words. And apply thy heart to understanding... Yea, if thou criest after what? Knowledge. Knowledge. And watch when you see these three together. And lift us up thy voice for understanding. If thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then thou shalt understand what? So I'm like, these, these three are pointing to something, guys. You see what it is? It's the fear of the Lord, right? Amen. Okay. Let's just start there. The Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Okay, we're getting somewhere. Let's go to chapter 9. We're just going to breeze through this quickly. Verse 10. The Proverbs of Solomon, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his hoof. I'm like, all right, he's starting to contrast a wise son and a foolish son. Amen. Look at 10. I already did 10. 10, 10 14. Wise men lay up what? Knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. It's more of this wise son, foolish son. And then this is when it popped into my mouth. See, this is where you need to get this stuff in you because I was like, the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. Didn't Paul say something like that? Destruction and misery are in their ways. Okay. Look at 14.6. Uh 14.16, my apologies. A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. And I was like, there was no fear of God before their eyes. Ah, that's a connection. All right, that's in there. And then look at uh, 15.2. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools pours out foolishness. And I'm like, there he is again, man, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. But there are some connections between Paul here. Now, I'm not preaching you this is your doctrine, guys, but sound words are sound words, amen? They are. And I'm seeing some connections here. 15.7, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge. So he told you in two, they use it. So we can say a wise man's going to use knowledge and he's going to give it back. He's going to disperse it, amen? That's what a wise man does. So I'm like, okay, that's Proverbs. Let's, is there anything going on in Ecclesiastes, right? Yeah, there is. We're not going to go through the whole thing. Look at Ecclesiastes 10. It's the same writer, Solomon. 10.14. I'm sorry. 10.12. Uh, and I saw this one twice. The words of a wise man's mouth are what? Let no corrupt communication proceed it out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister what? Grace, Grace into the ears. Look at the second half of it. But the lips of a fool will swallow them up. Their throat is an open sepulcher with the tongues they have used to seat the poison of asses under their what? Lips. All right, Paul, what are you trying to show me, man? This is when I really start digging in, man. This is like a 50-hour message, guys, because I'm like, God, what are you showing me, God? Where is this taking me? 
Well, let's go to the end of the book, right? Let's, we started at the beginning. Let's look at the end. Look at Ecclesiastes 12. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What is it, guys? Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now, I have to pause here. I know you guys understand the doctrine, but just in case somebody doesn't, I have to make a couple quotes. I'm not preaching you the law of Moses, amen? I'm not telling you that's your doctrine, that you're under it. Why? But if you, led, if you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the what? You all understand that, right? Paul says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I what? Died, and the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. So commandment equals death. Amen? I'm not telling you Solomon's telling you you got to keep it. This is why Paul says in Romans 7, 6, Now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held. You ever consider a passage like that? He's basically saying when you put yourself under the law, you are held in death. Nothing you can do about that. Whoa. He says that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of what? There it is. It says for in Galatians, for I through the law am dead to the law that I might what? You got to be dead to that law if you're going to ever live unto God. Amen. I'm not preaching them commandments to you. Well, how are you going to do that? Right? That's the major question. We understand. How are we going to do it? Romans 8, for as many as are, get it, led by the Spirit of God, they are what? Sons of God. So it's about that leading of the Spirit, right? Amen. So really, are you a, a wise son or a foolish son? It's really what I'm seeing here in, in Ecclesiastes. Look at 14. This is the one that really piqued my interest here. Because I said, see the double comma on that? So you could almost break it off into three sections. For God shall bring every work into judgment, comma. And I'm like, man, didn't Paul say that? Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall what? Try every man's work of what sort it is. What's this next part? With every secret thing. I'm like, therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. Whoa, Solomon and Paul ain't so far off now, are they? So what's the next one? It's all men, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Paul, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to, here it is, that he hath done, whether it be good or what. Oh, Solomon said evil. Paul said bad. Oh my goodness, they're so different, right? It's not that different, guys. So where am I going with this? Go to Ephesians 5. I'll, I'll show you. Well, you got to look at it like this too, guys. Do we serve a holy God or not? Is He a holy God of Israel? Is He a holy God of the body of Christ? Do we think we're all going to be all that different, right? I'll just say, Peter calls Paul in his epistle our beloved brother Paul. Do you know what that means? That means Peter's your brother too. You're not, you're of one family, guys. I, you got to rightly divide it, but you also need to start learning this at some point. How to connect it back together. And, and that's what I think God is showing me here. So Ephesians 5, man, I love this chapter. This is the chapter I've probably stared at more than any other chapter in this book. My pages are falling apart. They're, they're soaked with the oil of my hands. It's really gross, but I love it, man. This is my sword. It's gotten sharp by getting dull, right? By using this thing. And I'm seeing some things in this chapter that are amazing. We're going to begin at uh, verse, verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And I used to skip verse 9. I'll tell you why. I didn't understand it. I just could not understand why it felt like Paul was throwing me a curveball there. And I've learned in my Bible that a parenthetical passage for understanding can be removed and it should still make sense. So I would take nine out, walk as children of light, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And I'm like, I understand that. So what on earth is this fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth? And one day God said, that's how you prove everything, and that's how you walk. That's why it's connecting them. We don't do anything, guys. Anything good in me is Him. 
In fact, I battle the Spirit of God when I'm nudged and led of it sometimes. Happened recently in my church. A guy needed a shower, and I'm like, I should give him some socks. And I was like, oh, just give him your worst socks. And the Spirit's like, no, give him your best socks. And I'm like, okay, your best socks, but the, not the brand new best sock. That's me that's fighting that leading of the Spirit of God, man. So read that now with that in mind. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And I'm like, now I get it, right? That's the proofing. That's the walk. It's Him. It's not me. i got to get out of the way. I only hinder the Spirit of God. So looking at that proof, and he says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful dark, fruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. And I spent a lot of years in the truth or community, okay? And I thought my ministry was digging around on YouTube and BitChute and exposing the devil and all his devices because I didn't read that passage. Because guess what I had? I had a ministry of shame, amen? I'm not supposed to be, Paul says, be uh, wise unto that which is good and what? Simple concerning you. So, I mean, get off that garbage, man. It's not good for you. It can hinder your walk. It'll, it'll steal your faith, really. You fill your head with all that, that device and all that evil, man. It just it makes you weep in there, man. You're, you're to be strengthened with might by his spirit. That's why, man, that's a ministry of shame. Get off that stuff if you're doing it. Anyway, he says, but all things that are approved are made manifest by the what? That's supposed to be Jesus in you, guys. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. And here's the section that I've looked at more than any other. Wherefore he saith, Awake, thou that sleepeth, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. I've gone back to Isaiah 60, man, lots of time. Looked at that. Why is Paul changing it? He don't even mention the dead back there in Isaiah. And I'm just like, wow, what is Paul showing me? What is This is how I'm seeing it right, right here, guys. And I'm not changing your Bible, but I couldn't understand that. I'm talking, I don't even know how many hours of staring at it. But I started writing it down. Like, break it down. Make it more simple for me. I'm a baby. I'll just say it. I need, to, I need basic understanding. And, and this is how my brain is currently viewing this. This is what kind of Paul's, I believe he's driving it here. And I'm only typing this out, or not typing it, writing it. If you're going to be awake, I write terribly. You just have to give me some grace. And alive. With light. And then it's like, see then. See then that. Because let's look at it. Awake, thou that sleepest. What is that? Wake up, right? Arise from the dead. You need to be alive. And Christ shall give thee light. So it's really two things. You're going to be awake and alive with light. And if that's going to happen, see then that. Now I'm like, okay, I can see where we're heading. I can see the purpose behind it. What's next? That ye walk what? So this is when I start like bollinger it out, right? I'm like, number one, walk circumspectly. Okay, what's that going to deal with? Read what's next. Redeeming what? This is how I got it too, guys. Redeeming time. I'm just going to put this in advance. Understanding the will of what? The will of the Lord. Now, this is where staring at the page with a little bit of knowledge of the English language comes in handy. Do you see those ings that not as fools? but is wise. Well, that's actually what brought me here is a connection to Solomon, man. Contrasting a wise son and a foolish son. It brought me full circle back to Paul. 
Redeeming the time. This is why it's been my most stared at passage. You got stuff like redeeming time, understanding the will of the Lord, being filled with the Spirit. And I want all those things. So I stare at this stuff. Lord, give me understanding. I want to know you. And, and he showed it to me. Strangely enough, I don't really study English, but it's through those ings that redeem ing the time, right? Understand ing the will of the Lord. That's actually called a present participle. What is that, preacher? I have no idea what that means. It's really just a verb, if you can go back to, to school. What's a verb? It's an action word, okay? And in this case, it's an ongoing action. So you don't get to take a day off from this, amen? And when I started to looking at this, I'm like, well, wouldn't a circumspect walk, being walking, seeing all around you, wouldn't you consider that's how you're going to be awake? I'm like, this, all right. So I already know at this point where this is going. I'm like, the Lord's showing me this. He says, wherefore, be ye not unwise. When Paul doubles down on something like that, you better perk up. He already said, don't be a fool, be wise, right? Now he's repeated it, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And then 18, you see all that and there? I have that hard black underline because that's telling me there's a plus sign there. There's an addition to Right, so I can see that that redeeming time and the understanding with the old Lord is going to deal with your walk. And that's going to deal with how you're going to be awake in God. And be not drunk with wine where it's in excess, but be what? All right. How did Christ say it? Um, hold on, let me write this. I, got, I can't do two things at once. I can't walk and chew bubble gum. Fill with the Spirit. It is the spirit that quickeneth, right? The flesh profited not that the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. So I don't even have to sell you on it. Being filled with the spirit is how you're going to be alive, amen? We already know that. And I'm like, all right, so what does that look like, right? What, how's the first word of the next verse begin? Speaking, right? Okay. What's the first word of the verse after that? Giving, Giving and submitting. All right, let's break it down. Speaking to who, though? Yourself. This is it's part of your walk, guys. It's speaking to yourself. In what? Speaking to yourself in Romans, right? Speaking to yourself in Ephesians. Those are good books, guys, but he don't tell you to speak to yourself in Romans or Ephesians. He tells you to speak to yourself in Psalms. Why? I mean, there are people who say there's only 13 epistles in this book. There's not. There's a whole Bible, a whole family in heaven and earth, and my apostles tell me to speak to myself in Psalms. Now, you can't very much well do that if you don't read them or you don't know them. Amen? So I'm like, okay, Paul, what's going on with Psalms? Why is he telling me to do that? Well, would you agree that Psalms contains Scripture? All Scripture is profitable for what? Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in what? That, here's your purpose. The man of God may be what? Perfect. Thoroughly furnished in all his work. So this has to deal with your perfection. Amen? That's why it's in there, man. The Apostle Paul is pointing you to something, man. You really need to perk up. He's pointing you back to Psalms for a reason. 20. He says, giving thanks always for just a couple things, right? For all things, man. And this is when I do, I start getting convicted as a man of God. I'm like, I don't do that very good, right? I murmur and I'm not always thankful. And I realized that Paul is laying out how to be filled with the Spirit, man. And really, just one of these alone you could work on for the rest of your life. Try giving thanks always for all things until the Lord bring you home. Good luck, right? That's why it's only the fruit of the Spirit that's going to do it. And that's a hard one. But he doesn't say and in between these verses, man. They're really boom, 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 meaning they're to be together. And the next one is submitting yourselves one to another in the what? Now you see how this is, has to do with your, your knowledge and your wisdom. It's... Connected, it's all connected is what I'm showing you guys, and I have already preached that I'm not preaching a law to you. 
But there's more stuff going here than just on the surface. And, and I just learned this the other day after I'd already studied this for probably, I don't even know, 100 hours, and then preached on it and then revised it and you know preached it to my family again, revised it again. And then right before I left the road of Missouri, I'm back staring at this page again because I want to know this stuff. God gave me this. And I'm like, this makes easier baby understanding. It's, it has to do with being awake and alive. It's really what it is. And it's two things. It deals with your walk and, and where you are with your being filled with the Spirit. And it's all a work of God. You're going to understand that, that you can't will yourself to walk better. You can't will yourself to stop sinning. You can't will yourself to do good works. The only thing you can do is believe this book. And the book's going to do that work for you. That's what I've come to understand, man. When I think I'm performing or I'm doing anything, man, i got to go back to Romans. i got to remind myself that I'm dead. My life's hidden God. It's all Him, guys. So let's look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 2. And uh, let's see, verse 11. Hey, Debbie's here. Yeah, we love that. Verse 11. Um, if I said that right. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 11. As you know, how we exhorted in comfort and charged everyone. You know how it charges. Like, honestly, I had a, a rough life in the world. I gave testimony to a brother earlier. I'll give you it again after the preacher later. But that charge I understood by getting arrested and getting in trouble. You, the cops will give you charges. And you are indebted to that. You have to go to the court and do whatever they tell you to get those charges dropped. So when you read that, Paul's like indebted you to something. So this church, he's saying, you're, you're indebted, you're going to have to do this. Every one of you, as a father doth his children, what he charge them? That ye would walk worthy of who? So it deals with your walk again. Who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. So I'm like, all right, he's given charges to walk worthy. Where else is this taking me? Look at Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4. Furthermore, verse 1, Then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more, for ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. And that's when I'm like, man, we got commandments of Paul now, right? They're not the law of Moses, but they are commandments. I need to know more. What's he talking about? And then he says, look, for this is the will of God. Even your sanctification, here's the purpose, that you should abstain from fornication. I'm like, okay, man, look at the colon. Here's the explanation of that that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and what? And honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond or defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. When I realized that that's a message to a church, it kind of freaked me out a little bit, right? That's a message to the church, guys. He's warning them that God's the avenger of that kind of behavior, yeah. meaning you could be guilty of it, and He's going to avenge it on you. Amen? He's not writing that back in Romans to the lost. That's a church, man. Take hold of that, guys. This will straighten your tie a little bit. He says, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto what? We talk about our calling in this doctrine a lot. Well, we can say right there, our calling's unto holiness, amen? It is. A lot of the brethren don't like to hear that word. So let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. So I'm seeing commandments, I'm seeing chargings, I'm seeing walks, callings, right? All these things. This is where it took me next, 2 Thessalonians 3. We'll start at verse 3. But the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. We're not all that faithful sometimes, amen? It's Him who's faithful, and I'm thankful of Him. And we have confidence in who? 
Paul has confidence in the Lord now touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. Amen? Back to the commandments. And I notice I'm like, it's almost a, a soft burn. He doesn't say we have confidence in you. Right? He says, I have confidence in the Lord touching you. That's different, guys. Paul's confidence is in Jesus Christ, not that church here. Yeah. Now he knows Christ will do the work through them and they're going to do those commandments. But this is when I'm like, commandments, man. Solomon talked about commandments. What is, what is the commandments? Like, what is he even talking about? I want to know what they are. I found, I'm not going to say these are exactly them, but go back to 1 Thessalonians 5. I found some. Call it Paul's 21 commandments. Look at verse, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But let us, he, he had just taught, you know, to be awake here. But let us who are of the day be sober. So I'm not going to write these all out. I'm just going to, if you take, if you're a note taker, I'll show you how to do it. B, boom. And then the second one is obtain. So be sober. But you see that pudding? There's that present participle again. So that's that ongoing action, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. So that ongoing action of putting on the breastplate of faith and love is how you're going to be sober. And then he's not talking about stop taking your medication there. He's talking about putting on faith and love. Amen? So that's the first one. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to the second one, obtain salvation. And this is the only one I want to dig in a little bit deeper. Um, let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2.13 because a lot of the brethren, they say, well, you know, checkbox, nailed it. That one's done, right? Well, is it? Let's look. Second Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks to, always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to what? Salvation, Salvation through. Now there's two things going on here. Sanctification of the Spirit and what? Now, we know for a fact that belief of the truth, the belief is the gospel is all you need to be justified unto eternal life. Amen? So why is there two things here? Right? So he is clearly not talking about just you were saved from hell because all you need to do is believe for that. Amen? So that gets me looking. What is sanctification of spirit then? That's the second half of this choosing to salvation. Amen? Like there's more going on here. Well, what is it? Let's look at uh, 1 Timothy 4. I think I found it. 1 Timothy 4, 15. Paul writes, meditate upon these things. That, that's a command of Paul that's not very taken up. Right? Most people, they just sit in the seat and then when church's over, they just move on, man. you got to meditate on, upon these stuff, guys. This means it's got to get in here and then it's got to dwell down here. And you consider it. Consider these things and the Lord give the understanding, you know. He's telling them, man, get it in here. Get it in your belly and your gut. Meditate upon it. Upon what? Well, everything He taught Timothy, amen. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. That means your entire being, everything you're about, you're given to this. And here's your purpose word, that. Thy profiting may appear to all. He says, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, thou shalt both, what? Save thyself and them that hear thee. So guys, there is a salvation that has to do with saving yourself by giving yourself wholly to this doctrine. And we're not talking about saving yourself from hell, amen? Now you might understand what obtaining salvation is. You get to do a part of that work, guys. It's Christ in you that actually does it, but some people aren't, they just refuse. They just say, no, I've done, I'm just going to sit on my hands and wait on the Lord, amen? There's, there's responsibility to this doctrine too, guys. It's all His work, but guess what? It's through us, man. We're not to just sit idle in this thing. So that obtained salvation, it's a command. 
And it's an ongoing one. Amen? So back to Thessalonians. So what's the next one? He says, Obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. And that you're probably like, Preacher, there's another one. Live together with Him. But that's... Uh, it's a comma. That's part of obtaining salvation. You're going to live with him through the obtaining of the salvation. And then he says, wherefore? Here's the next one. Comfort. So comfort line. Comfort who? Yourselves together. Sometimes we don't do that. It's easy to comfort others often. As you know, you're supposed to comfort yourself too. Comfort yourselves together. Edification. Unity of the Spirit. These things should be coming to mind as I'm teaching this. And he says it. Next one. Four. Edify one another. And he gives them credit for that, even as also you do. Amen. Good, good job, church. I know this church does as well. And we beseech you, brethren, here's the next one, to know. What do you want us to know, Paul? Them which labor among you and, and here, get it, are what? Over you in the Lord. Boy, nobody likes having somebody over them. Like, I already clocked out from work. I worked 16 hours. Nobody's over me after that. Well, there should be someone over you, man. I need people over me. I'm thankful for preachers over me, man. I need eyes on my back to keep me straight. Paul told you in Ephesians, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That's somebody who's over you. Because you can't forget, you have a master in heaven no matter what. We don't have this thing figured out, man. This is how the body functions. There's, uh, in the multitude of counselors is what? Safety, too. Amen. He says, all right, so the next one where we leave off? To know. And are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to next one, esteem. Esteem them very highly in what? Love for their work's sake. And next one, be. What? Be what? At peace amongst yourself. That's one we all can work on every day, right? That's a tough one, man, being at peace in the anguish, in the afflictions, but that's the understanding that passes. That's the peace of God that passes understanding. There's wisdom in it. Next one, do you see it? Warn. Warn who? Next one, comfort who? Next one, support who? Next one, be what? Next one, C. What do we see in Paul? That's, do you ever hear the word vigilance? That's being vigilant right there. Next one, follow. What are we following? Amen. Next one, rejoice. How, how much? Evermore. Pray without what? He says, in everything. Here's the next one, give. What are we giving? He said that same thing in Ephesians. And then you get a quench not what? Next command, despise not what? You know, that's not just somebody who tells the future. The church has gotten some of these words wrong, man. They think it's just somebody who's saying, I predict that God said next week. It's, you know, this is, I'm prophesying right now, guys. It's just speaking the word of God, amen? And some people, they don't like this. They despise this speaking and edifying of the word of God. So that's the warning there. That's the command, and it's still for today. Next one, prove. How many things? Next one, hold fast. What? And the last one, abstain. And notice it's changed now. Remember it was abstain from fornication? Guess what? He's up to Annie. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Jesus used to do that too, remember? If you have looked at a woman with lust in your eyes, you committed adultery already. They were like, man, I thought I was an adulterer. Now I am. He was up in the ante on him. Paul kind of did it to us here. And see, this is when... I have a former legalist mind, right? Several years in that stuff. This is when I have to be careful. I'm looking to understand Paul, and I'm finding words of knowledge and wisdom and understanding and the fear of the Lord, and I got commandments of Solomon, and I think I understand that. And I, Now I got these commandments of Paul, though, and this is definitely my doctrine, and I'm to do these things. And what yeah, I have to watch out for is I can go out and buy a cork board, put... 21 commands of Paul, you know, number one, be sober. And every day I go up and check, I'm sober today, you know. And I'll, I'll turn it into the law of Paul. I really will do this, guys. 
I have to be very, very careful of that. And I'm not telling you you're not to do these things. I'm just saying there's a mindset. you got to take this in in a certain manner or you will build yourself a law of Paul. You will start to perform for God again. And now you got to go all the way back to Romans when you start to do that. And remember you're dead and you don't do a thing. Amen. You know, that's... So I'm like, all right, I got to do these things, but I can't do these things. How does this even work? You know, I don't understand it. Paul, I need you to like break this down and make it easier for me, man. So I'm like, okay, let's go to Timothy. I think I, I got an understanding of how do I keep these commands without turning them into a law? First Timothy 1, we're, we're made a circle back. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by what? The commandment of God. I'm like, there it is, our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Look down at verse 5. He says, now the end of the what? I'm like, all right, here we're getting somewhere. He's told me, I don't even have to worry about it. He's told me the end of the commandment is what? Charity, Charity out of a pure heart and of a good what? Conscience. Would you agree with me that, that a good conscience could be hope? Amen. Where's that? It's your mind. It's, to me, I see hope there and of faith unfeigned. And it made me think of Paul's teaching on faith, hope, and charity, right? And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm getting this law of Paul boiled down a little bit. He just told me the end of this is basically faith, hope, and charity. I'm like, okay, that's a little easier. Three is better than 21, right? I don't have so many checkboxes now. But is that right either? Not really. I'm like, there's got to be an even easier way, man, because I'll turn that too. Look at 1 Timothy 2. Verse, uh, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will, so you could kind of say this is God's will, who will have all men to be what? Number one, and to come unto what? The knowledge of the truth. So there's two things there, all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, a lot of the brethren make that knowledge of truth after right division. It's not. I hate to tell you it's not, guys, but it isn't. Look at Titus 1. Paul tells you what it's after. We don't. Some of this stuff we don't have to stare darkly. It's expressly said. Timothy 1. Titus 1. Yes, sir. He knows it already. Verse 1. Paul, servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the what? Faith. There's faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the what? Truth. truth, which is after what? Godliness. So that knowledge of the truth is not after right division, it's after godliness. Amen. Amen. And would you say the acknowledging of the truth after godliness could be considered charity? I see it, guys. So faith, charity, in what? Hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised when? Before the world began. So I'm like, okay. Faith, hope, and charity. I see it again. Faith, hope, and charity. It brings me back to things Paul's taught. I'm like, where does this take us? You know, it's Corinthians, right? The charity chapter. I'll just quote it to you. It, it's really Paul, when he's speaking about a child growing up into a man and giving you that vision, and it's in relation to becoming that which is perfect in chapter 13. He says, and now abideth what? Faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is which? Charity. I'm like, okay. We've gone from 21 down to three. Three, I can highlight charity. That's the greatest, right? So where does that take me? It takes me to Colossians chapter three. Amen, brother. <laughs> You're fun to preach for. <clears throat> Well, if you look at 3.10 and have put on the new man, back in Ephesians, he was saying in that ye, almost like do this. Now it's have. So this is a more grown up doctrine. You should basically be putting on the new man by this stage, which is renewed in what? All the way back to where we started. After the image of him that created him. And then he says in verse 12, put on some of these things. We're not going to cover them, but in 14, Paul knew it. And above all these things, put on what? Charity. 
which is the bond of love. Do you know what a bond is? You know what it is? It's you're bound. It's like you're in cuffs. You're chained. You know, you got people, oh, I'm, I'm not under the law. You ain't putting me back under the law, right? I'm not under the law. Well, you're, you should be under charity. Amen. It's your bond of perfectness, right? Amen. See, why don't we see things like that, man? It's what the doctrine is teaching us, man. Because really, at the end of the day, you, it's being bound to Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what Paul was talking about. The prisoner of the Lord. Paul no longer considered himself living unto himself. He was living unto Jesus Christ, which did not allow him to act a certain way. He was bound. I watched that man do it, man, when he's teaching. Some of the brethren who... I'm a man, guys. I get frustrated with people. I get bitter towards them. I think they're, they're being ridiculous sometimes. And it's almost worse when it's not you. Like, I get angry for Paul. I'm like, I can't believe he's dealing with some of these people, man. And I, I know he's a man. I know he, he feels wrath and hatefulness. But, but his bondage to charity and perfectness, I don't see it outwardly. He goes, man, he'll just probe and search the Word of God and put space in between that. That's, the Spirit always lies in some space between when you want to do something and when you find what's excellent, Amen. man. That's really what needs to happen. You need to just shut your mouth and go to the Lord and say, what is excellent, Lord? I can't find it. You know, and sometimes, and sometimes you still may not come up with it. But I know what, what, the, what the answer to that is too. It's this. You don't have enough of this in you. This, guys, is... you got to get in this book all the time. But at some point, it's got to get in here. It's got to get down here because... When I'm at work and my hips are burning and my back's hurting, I don't have time to just say, pause, pause, I'm going to go read my Bible to figure out how to handle this. <laughs> no, it's got to be in there swimming in me so I can meditate upon it. How do I handle this? I have this unreasonable client and I just want to flip out, but I can't. I'm in bondage to charity. Word, God, show me. Show me what's excellent. Show me what's perfect. That's how it's got to learn to be function, guys. And it really all starts, I hate to say it, guys, but it all starts back with fear of the Lord. I fear God. I fear what He can do. I fear that He's my Creator. I want to be a vessel of honor and not a vessel of dishonor. Amen? I mean, if you don't fear God, Paul basically said you're a fool who doesn't know anything. Okay, that's too harsh. You're unwise who doesn't know anything. Right? That's what he's driving at. And it all comes through this book right here, man. But it's got to reside Amen. down here. Amen. That's all I got, brother. Thanks. Yep. Thanks.